pearl pie hair smells clean and sweet. It's soft like cotton. Flower petals, billowy soft. Full of frizzy and fuzz. A halo, a crown. Oh, I need my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> A mm -hmm. covering for heads that are round. It can be smooth or padded down, pulled tight, cut close, or just let go so wind can carry it all over the place. Flare to comb, oh, I'm sorry, hair to comb, hair to brush, to twist and flat, or just lie flat. Pages are sticking together. Hair for hands, to touch and play. Hair to take the gloom away. See all those nice colors? Sitting still for hands to brush or braid and make the day start hopefully. All kinks gone. All hands of joy. Look at all those different kinds of hair. Isn't that beautiful? These short, tight naps. Or plaited strands all. Let girls go running free. <laughs> happy to be nappy. Happy with hair all short and strong. Happy with locks that twist and curl. Just all girl happy. Happy to be nappy hair. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> And it's by Carlos Speedy. <laughs> Me and mommy go dancing. I have been waiting all week long. We have, uh, we have so much fun that I could go every day. We step into the dance collective to get our groove on, to get down, to throw down, to let it all hang out, to bring it, to handle it, to even get funky, all at the same time. <laughs> um, <coughs> Mommy's Lapis from Senegal. She bought it when she was at a dance conference. My Lapa is from Ghana. She bought it for me when we went there for the Panafest. Before each class, Queen Sister Nzinga stretches us out good. She also, she does do that, right? <laughs> she also reviews the steps that we'll be doing when we are dancing down the floor. We love dancing Linjin, the dance of the birds. Mommy's favorite dance is Lamba, the healing dance. My favorite dance is Manjani, the celebration dance. We do dances like John Dunn, Wola Sadun, Dance of the Slaves from Bondage to Freedom, and Soko, the liberation dance. <coughs> Bumani thinks Soko is a great dance, and Ikonkong. We love Kakilambe, the dance of the female deity of the forest. And more Kakilambe because the dance steps are so wonderful. She brings bountiful harvest. There's Dundumba, the strong man's dance. This is Bumani's favorite dance. Bumani's dad is the lead drummer. That means he solos on top of the accompaniment. His drum is called Jimbe. He's the most popular 
uh, it is the most popular indigenous drum in the world. Then I'll kind of go to the end. <coughs> We sweat a lot because cardio is good for your heart. We laugh a lot because laughter is good, is the best medicine. Mm -hmm. At the end of each class, we form a circle and do solos. Everybody jumps out and does their best steps. I jumped out and did the best solo of my life. <laughs> my solo was so good that Queen Sister Nzinga took off her cowrie shell belt and gave it to me. Aww. <laughs> yeah. Aww. I'm going to read Daisy and the Doll. I chose this book because when I was little, I loved dolls. It is written by Michael Medeiros and Angela Shelf Medeiros. I've never read to a group this large, so this is my first time. Mm -hmm. My name is Jesse Daisy Turner, but everyone calls me Daisy. I'm eight years old and in the middle child of 13 children. We live on a farm in Grafton, Vermont. From my window, I can see the fields of beautiful daisies I was named for. That's a lot of kids, huh? Mm -hmm. My favorite time of day is after our chores are finished and we've eaten dinner. Then my daddy and mama, Papu and Mamu, and my uncle Early tell stories and sing songs. We all take turns making up poems, even the children. On Saturdays, our neighbors come over and we square dance the night away. Sometimes, Papu Mommy, lets me call the steps. I go to school in the village. Every Monday morning, my teacher, Miss Clark, makes special announcements. One day, she said to us, Class, as you know, Friday is the last day of school. This year, for the end of school program, we are going to recite poems all about the different countries and nationalities from around the world. There will be a prize for the best speaker. I want this to be the best program we've ever done. Miss Clark passed out slips of paper to everyone and gave each girl a doll to carry in the program. She handed me a rag doll with a coal black face. Some of the girls giggled a little when they saw my doll. Your doll's name is Dinah, Miss Clark said, and here's the poem I wrote for you. I read the poem over and over. Anger bubbled up inside like hot tar. As soon as school was out, I ran home. Papu was busy clearing a field of tree stumps. When he saw my tears, he wrapped his arms around me. What's the matter, Daisy? Papu said. Everyone laughed when they saw the doll Miss Clark gave me, I said. And here's the poem she wants me to recite. Papu read the poem, and we sat quietly for a long time. Daisy, Papu said, look at all the flowers in the trees out there and tell me which one is the prettiest. Well, they're all beautiful, Papu, I said. My dear little Daisy, Papu said, when I look at you, I see the prettiest girl in Grafton, Vermont. You can present your black doll in the program and be just as proud as anyone, as anyone else. Now go on and memorize your poem. Look at that Papu gave me a, a hug and I hugged him back. As I walked up the hill to the house, something became clear to me. I had never really noticed the color of my skin. It was as if Miss Clark's poem had opened my eyes for the first time. My father, my brothers, and my sisters are a variety of colors, from pale, buttered color yellow to rich, dark mahogany. My mother is almost as white as Miss Clark. Skin color had never been important to me until that day. The last week of school seemed to fly by. I tried to practice the poem Miss Clark had given me, 
but the words seemed to stick in my throat. Daisy Turner, Miss Clark scolded. You are usually so good at reading poems. Do you think you'll be able to see your, say your poem tonight? I just nodded my head. I felt very sick at the thought of saying that poem. That evening, almost everyone in town crowded into the schoolhouse. My class sat in front, my class sat in the front row. I was the last one in line. Every girl except me was dressed in her best frock. I wore an old red school dress. For the first time in my life, I felt ashamed of the way I looked. Miss Clark gave a short welcoming speech and introduced the two contest judges. They took their seats on the stage. Amy Davis was in the program. She smiled at the crowd as she cradled her, her doll in her arms and said, my dolly came from France. Her name is Antoinette. She's two years old on Christmas day and a very darling pet. I hope she'll take the prize. <laughs> Amy twirled her skirt as she walked across the stage. She sat down and gently placed Antoinette on a chair in front of her. One by one, my classmates recited their speeches and sat on the stage. The crowd clapped loudly and cheered at the end of each poem. Finally, it was my turn. My feet felt like lead as I walked to the center of the stage. I hung my head and stared down at my shoes. I tried to say the words that Miss Clark had written but they caught in my throat like a bone. Someone coughed. It sounded like Papu. I looked out into the crowd. He smiled. His smile warmed me like the sun. I took a deep breath, and I stood tall, just like the pine trees that surrounded our house. I started reciting a poem, but I did not say the poem verses that Miss Clark had written. Anger turned my voice to a high pitch. You needn't crowd my dolly out, although she's black as night. And if she's at the end of the show, I think she'll stand as good a chance as dollies that are white. Miss Clark turned red. She stood up as if to stop me from speaking. Papu rose and stood, started down the aisle. I was scared, but the words continued to pour out of some deep place in my heart. My papu says that half the world is nearly black as night, and it does no harm to take a chance and stay right in the light. So sit up, Dolly, look hard and straight at the judges on your right, and I will stand close by your side, though I do look a fright. When I finished, everyone stared at, at me in shock. Strange silence filled the room as I took my seat. It was as it was as it was as if the audience was holding its breath. The two judges whispered to each other for a long time. Then a judge named Mr. Beck peered over his glasses. Daisy Turner, come forward, he said. I felt like I was walking underwater as I moved towards the center of the stage. Miss Turner, Mr. Beck said, that was the most original and honest presentation we had ever heard in a child's program. You, you let us know just how you felt. You are the winner of the end of, end of school program. Here is your prize. He reached into his pocket and handed me a $10 gold piece. Everyone stood and applauded, even Miss Clark. They were all clapping for me. On the way home, I held the gold piece in the palm of my hand. It glittered in the light. You just keep right on speaking the truth, Daisy Turner, Papu said. You'll do just fine. I will, Papu, I said. I snuggled next to him and cradled Dinah in my arms. You know what, Papu, I said? Dinah looks a little like me. Well, so she does, Papu said. And that's what makes her the prettiest little girl in Grafton, Vermont. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2015 African American Read-In. 
I thought I'd give you a little bit of history about how this has actually come to the Jane Bancroft Cook Library. So the read-in is being hosted by the Jane Bancroft Cook Library, but in collaboration with the New College Black History Month Committee and the University of South Florida Sarasota Manatee. The read-in actually has been done around the United States um, since 1990, so it's been around for a while. In November of 1989, the Black Caucus of the National Council of Teachers of English sponsored a nationwide read-in on the first Sunday in February. At the request of some of the educators, the first Monday in February was designated for read-ins in educational institutions. The African American read-in has a long history on this campus. In the late 1990s, the read-in was sponsored by the USF Student Reading Council, and it was held under a tent near the USF um, Student Center, which is just across the street at what we now know as Counseling and Wellness. Um, the library acted in a support role by setting up book displays um, so that the readers could pick their readings from our collection. Eventually, the Student Reading Council disbanded, and the library took over the sponsorship of the read-in. The timing for the read-in was problematic at the time, and that was because um, many of the public libraries in Sarasota and Manatee County were closed on Sunday, so that first Sunday in February was difficult for the public libraries. And then, for this campus in particular, the first Monday in February was always the first day of classes for new college students. So that made it problematic. And USF shared the campus at the time, and most of their classes were in the evening. So we had a little bit of a problem with the date, but we persevered anyway. And so a number of years ago, what happened was that the event was open to be done at any time during the month of February. So we celebrated because we could actually choose a date that, that might be a little bit better than um, had been established. And throughout the years, the library has joined forces with various groups um, at New College and USF to sponsor the event. The, the past sponsors include the USF Sarasota Manatee Student Government, the New College Gender and Diversity Center, and the New College, Gen College Gender Studies Program. So we really have been a very collaborative um, partner with um, groups on both of the campuses. And throughout the years, we've had many, many loyal readers from both USF Sarasota Manatee and New College. And we want to particularly thank the faculty at both of the schools who have encouraged their students to attend and read at the event. Um, a few years ago, we added a very nice component of setting aside a specific time to read children's books. And we were delighted to have the children from the New College Child Care Center with us at the readings. If you arrived a little bit early, you saw how the children just really were enthralled with um, the readings that were done. Um, last year, because we had some staff shortages in the library, we weren't able to sponsor the read-in. But the tradition did continue because the New College Student Affairs Office stepped in and a reading was held on Z Green. Um, so I'm delighted to say that today the read-in is back in the library. And I really want to thank the hard work of this year's committee um, for the read-in to once again be brought home. And now the legacy continues with readings by African American authors and poets. Hello again. <laughs> well, there's probably a list of who's about to go next, but I have a class in like 12 minutes, so I'm going to go. <laughs> and then um, Nasir McIntosh is going to take over as the MC. All righty. <laughs> um, I'm reading The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes, and I'm doing it on my phone, so if, I, like, if you see me look down and like, start tapping, that means my phone just timed out. <laughs> I don't need, I have a booming voice, I think. All right. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood and human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I have seen it. 
muddy, bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. My soul, my soul has grown deep like the rivers. Hello everyone, I am your host, Mr. McIntosh. Um, nice to see you all here. Next on the list, we have Shirley Martini again. Is that, no? Oh, different Shirley, different Shirley. Oh, okay, oh, perfect. Two Shirleys, awesome, perfect, thank you. Well, I have mine on my iPad and it's kind of small and I'm blind, so. I might have to hold it up a little close. Um, my reading is a speech from Nelson Mandela. Um, it's kind of long, so bear with me. No, no, it's just, just that it's small. Um, it was given on It was given in May of 1994. Your Majesties, Your Highness, distinguished guests comrades and friends. Today, all of us do by our presence here and by our celebrations in other parts of our country and the world, confer glory and hope to newborn liberty. Out of the experience of an ordinary human disaster that lasted too long, must be born a society of which all humanity will be proud. Our daily deeds as ordinary South Africans must produce an actual South African reality that will reinforce humanity's belief in, belief in justice, strengthen its co confidence in the nobility of the human, and sustain all our hopes for a glorious life for all. All this we owe both to ourselves and to the people of the world who are so well represented here today. To my compatriots, I have no hesitation in saying that each one of us is as intimately attached to the soil of this beautiful country as are the famous jacaranda trees of Pretoria and the mimosa trees of the Bushveld. Every time one of us touches the soil of this land, we feel a, se a sense of personal renewal. The national mood changes as the seasons change. We are moved by a sense of joy and exhilaration when the grass turns green and the flowers bloom. That spiritual and physical oneness we all share with this common homeland explains the depth of the pain we all carried in our hearts as we saw our country tear itself apart in the terrible conflict, and as we saw it spurned, outlawed, and isolated by the peoples of the world, precisely because it has become the universal base of the pernicious ideology and practice of racism and racial oppression. We, the people of South Africa, feel fulfilled that humanity has taken us back into its bosom that we, who are outlaws not so long ago, have today been given the rare privilege to be host of the nations to the world on our own soil. We thank all our distinguished international guests for having come to take possession with the people of our country of what is, after all, a common victory for justice, for peace, and human dignity. We trust that you will come Continue to stand by us as we tackle the challenges of building peace, prosperity, non-sexism, non-racism, and democracy. We deeply appreciate the role of the masses of our people and their political mass, demogra democratic, religious, women, youth, business, traditional, and other leaders have played to bring about this conclusion. Not many among them is my second deputy president, the Honorable F.W. de Klerk. We would also like to pay tribute to our, our security forces in all their ranks for all distinguished roles they have played in securing our first democratic elections and the transition to democracy from bloodthirsty forces which will refuse to see the light. The time for the healing of the wounds has come. The moment to bridge the chasms that divide us has come. The time to build is upon us. We have, at last, achieved our political emancipation. We pledge ourselves to liberate all our people from the continuing bondage of poverty, deprivation, suffering, gender, and other discriminations. We succeed to take our last steps to freedom in conditions of relative peace. We commit ourselves to the construction of a complete, just, and lasting peace. 
We have triumphed in the effort to implant hope of the breasts of million of our people. We enter into a covenant that we shall build the society in which all South, Af South Africans, both black and white, will be able to walk tall without any fear in their hearts, assured that of their inalienable, inalienable right to human dignity, a rainbow nation at peace with itself and the world. As a token of its commitment to the renewal of our country, the new interim government of national unity will, as a matter of urgency, address the issue of amnesty for various categories of our people who are currently serving terms of imprisonment. We dedicate this day to the heroes and heroines of the country, of the rest of the world who sacrificed in many ways to surrender their lives so that we could be free. Their dreams have become reality. Freedom is their reward. We are both humbled and elevated by the honor and privilege that you, the people of South Africa, have bestowed on us as the first president of a united, democratic, non-racial, and non-sexist South Africa to lead our country out of the valley of darkness. We understand, it's, we understand it still that there is no easy road to freedom, yet it will, well the none of, act, of us acting alone can achieve success. We must therefore act together as a united people for national reconciliation, for national building, and for the birth of a new world. Let there be justice for all. Let there be peace for all. Let there be work, bread, water, and salt for all. Let us each know that for each, the body, the mind, and the soul have been freed to fulfill themselves. Never, never, and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another and suffer the indignity of being the skunk of the world. Let freedom reign. The sun shall never set on so glorious a human achievement. God bless Africa. Thank you. Angela North. Hello. I have three poems to share. From One is from Maya Angelou, and the other two are from Langston Hughes. The first one is The Caged Bird by Maya Angelou. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful, fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still and his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees and the fat worms wait on a dawn bright lawn and he names the sky his own. But a cage bird stands on the grave of dreams, his shadow shouts of nightmare scream his wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom. Well, I'm coming with, again, something by Maya Angelou. But this time, the name of this is Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got all wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons like sun, with the certainty of ties, 
Just like hope springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soul for cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the hut of history, shame, I rise. Up from a past that rooted in pain, I rise. I am a black ocean leaping and wide. Welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. And to a daybreak that wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of slaves. I rise, I rise, I will rise. I think that we have a lot of readers scheduled, so I'm going to go with the shortest of the readings that I brought, which is also another Maya Angelou, and it's my Arkansas. So there is a deep brooding in Arkansas, old crimes like moss penned from poplar trees. The sullen earth is much too red for comfort. Sunrise seems to hesitate, and in that second lose its incandescent aims and dusk no more shadows than the noon. The past is brighter yet. Old hates and antebellum lace are rent, but not discarded. Today is yet to come in Arkansas. It writhes. It writhes in awful waves of brooding. I'm going to read Ain't I a Woman by Sojourner Truth, former slave and abolitionist. Uh, delivered at uh, 1851 at the Women's Convention in Akron, Ohio. White women. Well, children, where there's so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women of the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here they're talking about? That man over there says that the women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best places everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or give me, gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me, look at my arms. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could hear, heed me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children, and seen most of them sold off into slavery. And when I cried out in my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. What do they call it? Intellect. That's it, that's it, honey. What's that got to do with women's rights or Negroes' rights? If my cup won't hold but a pint and yours holds a quart, wouldn't you mean not to let me have my little half measure full? Then that little man in black over there says he, he can't ha women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. If the first woman ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now, they is asking me to do it. The men better let them. Obliged to you for hearing me. And now old Sojourney ain't got nothing more to say. And also, Content warning for use of slurs, racial slurs. So there's that, okay. 
I had said I wasn't going to write no more poems like this. I, conf I had confessed to myself all along, tracer of life, poetry trends, that awareness, consciousness, poems that screamed of pain and the origins of pain and death had blanketed my tablets. And therefore my friends, brothers, sisters, in-laws, outlaws, and besides, they already knew, but Brother Therese, common ancient bloodline, Brother Therese is dead. I had said I wasn't going to write no more poems like this. I had said I wasn't going to write no more words down about people kicking us when we're down, about racist dogs that attack us and drive us down, drag us down, and beat us down. But the dogs are in the street. The dogs are alive, and the terror in our hearts has scarcely diminished. It has scarcely brought us the comfort we suspected. The recognition of our terror and the screaming release of that recognition has not removed the certainty of that knowledge. How could it? The dogs, rabid, foaming with the energy of their brutish ignorance, stride the city streets with, like robot gunslingers and spread death as night lamps flash crude reflections from gun butts and police shields. I had said I wasn't going to write no more poems like this, but the battlefield has oozed away from the stilted debates of semantics, beyond the questionable flexibility of primal screaming. The reality of our city, jungle streets and their, their gestapos, has become an attack on home, life, family, and philosophy. Total. It is beyond the question of the advantages of didactic niggerisms. The motherfucking dogs are in the street. In Houston, maybe someone said Mexicans with the new niggers. In LA, maybe someone said Chicanos with the new niggers. In Frisco, maybe someone said Orientals with the new niggers. Maybe in Philadelphia and North Car maybe in Philadelphia and North Carolina, they decided they didn't need no new niggers. I had said I wasn't going to write no more poems like this, but the dogs are in the street. It's a turnaround world where things are all too quickly turned around. It was turned around so that right looked wrong. It was turned around so that up looked down. It was turned around so that those who marched in the streets with Bibles and signs of peace became enemies of the state and risked the national security. So that those who questioned the operations of those in authority on the principles of justice, liberty, and equality became the vanguard of a communist attack. It became so you couldn't call a spade a motherfucking spade. Brother Therese is dead. The Wilmington 10 are still incarcerated. Ed Davis, Ronald Reagan, James Hunt, and Frank Rizzo are still alive. And the dogs are in the motherfucking street. I had said I wasn't going to write no more poems like this. I made a mistake. I'm reading from a novel written by Chimamanda Adichie who was born in Nigeria, and she now lives both in Nigeria and the United States. The novel examines blackness in America, Nigeria, and Britain from the perspective of a young woman named Efemilu, who was raised in Nigeria but emigrates to the US to finish college. In her native country, Efemilu did not realize she was black. She learned that she fit that description only after arriving in America. This first passage, so I'm going to read one little passage and then um, a blog post that the character writes. The first passage occurs after she arrives in the US, overcomes the initial hurdles of getting enrolled in university, and realizes that while school in America was easy, she was mystified by the nuances of American tribalism. She hungered to understand everything about America, to wear a new knowing skin right away, to support a team at the Super Bowl, understand what a Twinkie was, what sports lockouts meant, measure in ounces and square feet, order a muffin without thinking that it was really a cake, and say, I scored a deal without feeling si silly. Obins, who was her boyfriend back in Nigeria, suggested that she read American books, novels, histories, and biographies. In his first email to her, a cyber cafe had just opened in Nasuka. He gave her a list of books. The fire next time was the first. She stood by the library shelf and skimmed the opening chapter, braced for boredom. But slowly she moved to a couch and sat down and kept reading until three quarters of the book was gone. Then she stopped and took down every James Baldwin title on the shelf. She spent her free hours in the library, so wondrously well lit. The sweep of computers, the large, clean, airy reading spaces. <laughs> and I'm a librarian. <laughs> this is why it's so touching to me. The welcoming brightness of it all seemed like a sinful decadence. She was used, after all, to reading books with pages missing, fallen off while passing through too many hands. 
and now to be a cavalcade of books with healthy spines. She wrote to Obens about the books she read, careful, sumptuous letters that opened, between them, a new intimacy. She had but begun finally to grasp the power books had over him. His longing for Ibadan because of Ibadan had puzzled her. How could a string of words make a person ache for a place he did not know? But in those weeks when she discovered the rows and rows of books with their leathery smell and their promise of pleasures unknown, when she sat, knees tucked underneath her, on an armchair in the lower level or at a table upstairs with a fluorescent light reflecting off the book's pages, she finally understood. She read the books on Obinz's list, but also randomly pulled out book after book, reading a chapter before deciding which she would speed read in the library and which she would check out. And as she read, America's mythologies began to take on meaning. America's tribalisms, race, ideology, and, re and region became clear, and she was consoled by her new knowledge. And as a result of this, later on in her life, after she already started her career, she started a blog. She had sent an, a long email to a friend. He replied, this is so raw and true. More people should read this. You should start a blog. Blogs were new, unfamiliar to her. She would later change the name, but at first she called it Race Teenth, or Curious Observations by a non-American black on the subject of blackness in America. <clears throat> and this is just one of, one of the posts. To my fellow non-American blacks, in America, you are black, baby. Dear non-American black, when you make the choice to come to America, you become black. Stop arguing. Stop saying I'm Jamaican or Ghanaian. America doesn't care. So what if you weren't black in your country? You're in America now. We, have, we all have our moments of initiation into the society of former Negroes. Mine was in a class in undergrad when I was asked to give the black perspective, only I had no idea what that was. So I just made something up. And admit it, you say I'm not black, only because you know black is at the bottom of America's race ladder. And you want none of that. Don't deny now. What if being black had all the privileges of being white? Would you still say, don't call me black, I'm from Trinidad? I didn't think so. So you're black, baby, and here's the deal with becoming black. You must show that you are offended when such words as watermelon or tar baby are used in jokes even if you don't know what the hell is being talked about. And since you are a non-American black, chances are that you won't know. In undergrad, a white classmate asks if I like watermelon. I say yes, and another classmate says, oh my God, that is so racist. And I'm confused. Wait, how? You must nod back when a black person nods at you in a heavily white area. It's called the black nod. It's a way for black people to say you are not alone. I am here too. In describing black women you admire, always use the word strong because that is what black women are supposed to be in America. If you are a woman, please do not speak your mind as you are used to doing in your country. Because in America, strong-minded women are scary. And if you are a man, be hyper mellow. Never get too excited or somebody will worry that you're about to pull a gun. When you watch television and hear that a racist slur was used, you must immediately become offended. Even though you're thinking, but why won't they tell me exactly what was said? Even though you would like to be able to decide for yourself how offended to be, or whether to be offended at all, you must nevertheless be very offended. When a crime is reported, pray that it was not committed by a black person. And if it does turn out to be committed by a black person, stay well away from the crime area for weeks, or you might be stopped for fitting the profile. If a black cashier gives poor service to the non-black person in front of you, Compliment that person's shoes or something to make up for the bad service because you're just as guilty for the cashier's crimes. If you're in an Ivy League college and a young rep Republican tells you that you got it only because of affirmative action, do not whip out your perfect grades from high school. Instead, gently point out that the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action are white women. If you go to eat in a restaurant, please tip generously. Otherwise, the next black person who comes in will get awful service because waiters groan when they get a black table. 
You see, black people have a gene that makes them not tip. So please overpower that gene. If you're telling a non-black person about something racist that happened to you, make sure that you are not bitter. Don't complain. Be forgiving. If possible, make it funny. Most of all, do not be angry. Black people are not supposed to be angry about racism. Otherwise, you get no sympathy. This applies only for white liberals, by the way. Don't even bother telling a white conservative about anything racist that happened to you, because that conservative will tell you that you are the real racist, and your mouth will hang open in confusion. Thanks. Um, yeah, I got here too late to do the kids' book thing, and that's what I really wanted to do, because um, they have the book Tar Beach that I checked out when I was a kid, and I really liked it. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read that. And it's by Faith Ringgold. I will always remember when the stars fell down around me and lifted me up above the George Washington Bridge. I could see our tiny rooftop with mommy and daddy and Mr. and Mrs. Honey, our next door neighbors, still playing cards as, cards as if nothing was going on. And BB, my baby brother, lying real still on the mattress, just like I told him to, his eyes like huge floodlights tracking me through the sky. Sleeping on Tar Beach was magical. Lying on the roof in the night with stars and, and skyscraper buildings all around me made me feel rich like I owned all I could see. The bridge was my most prized possession. Daddy said that the George Washington Bridge is the longest and most beautiful bridge in the world and that it opened in 1931 on the very day I was born. Daddy worked on that bridge hoisting cables. Since then, I've wanted that bridge to be mine. Now I have claimed it. All I had to do was fly over it for two, fly over it for it to be mine forever. I can wear it like a giant diamond necklace or just fly above it and marvel at its sparkling beauty. I can fly, yes fly. Me, Cassie Louise Lightfoot, only eight years old and in the third grade and I can fly. That means I'm free to go wherever I want for the rest of my life. Daddy took me to see the new union building he is working on. He can walk on steel girders high up in the sky and not fall. They call him the cat. But still he can't join the union because Grandpa wasn't a member. Well, Daddy is going to own that building because I'm going to fly over it and give it to him. Then it won't matter that he's not in their old union or whether he's colored or a half-breed Indian like they say. He'll be rich and won't have to stand on 24-story high girders and look down. He can look at his building going up. And mommy will cry all winter when he goes to look for work and doesn't come home. And mommy can laugh and sleep late like Mrs. Honey and we can have ice cream every night for dessert. Next I'm going to fly over the ice cream factory just to make sure we do. Tonight we're going up to Tar Beach. Mommy is roasting peanuts and frying chicken and daddy will, be, will bring home a watermelon Mr. and Mrs. Honey will bring the beer and their old green card table. And then the stars will fall around me and I will fly to the union building. I will take BB with me. He has threatened to tell mommy and daddy if I leave him behind. I have told them it's very easy. Anyone can fly. All you need is somewhere to go that you can't get to any other way. The next thing you know, you're flying among the stars. Um, this is a recorded poem uh, by Jill Scott Heron, um, and it was vital in influencing uh, rap music and themes. It's called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. You will not be able to stay at home, brother. You will not be able to plug in, turn on, cup out. You will not be able to lose yourself on Skag and skip out for a beer doing commercials because the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by Syrahs in four parts without commercials interruption. The revolution will not show you pictures of Nixon blowing a bugle and leading a charge by John Mitchell, 
General Abramson and Spiro Agnew to eat hug moss confiscated from a Harlem sanctuary. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by the Schaefer Award Theory and will not star Natalie Wood and Steve McQueen or Bullwinkle and Julia. The revolution will not give your mouth sex appeal. The revolution will not get rid of the knobs. The revolution will not make you look five pounds thinner. The revolution will not be televised, brother. There will be no pictures of you and Willie May pushing that shopping cart down the block on the dead run or trying to slide that color TV in stolen ambulance. NBC will not be able to predict the winner at 8.32 on reports from the 29th district. Their revolution will not be televised. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on instant replay. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on instant replay. There will be no slow motion or still lives of Roy Wilkins strolling through Watts in a red, black, and green liberation jumpsuit that he has been saving for just, just the proper occasion. Green Acres, Beverly Hillbillies, and Hooterville Junction will no longer be so damn relevant. And women will not care if Dick finally got down with Jane on search for tomorrow, because black people will be in the streets looking for a brighter day. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no highlights on the 11 o'clock news and no pictures of hairy armed woman liberationist and Jackie Onassis blowing her nose. The theme song will not be written by Jim Webb or Francis Scott Key, nor sung by Glenn Campbell, Tom Jones, Johnny Cash, Engelbert Humperdinck, or Rare Earth. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be right back after a message about a white tornado, white lightning, or white people. You will not have to worry about a dove in your bedroom, the tiger in your tank, or the giant in your toilet bowl. The revolution will not go better with coke. The revolution will not fight germs that may cause bad breath. The revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, not be televised, be televised. The revolution will not be rerun, brothers. The revolution will be live. Hello, y'all. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, there was one rule, and that was to bring a book, and then I didn't even do that. So I hope <laughs> you guys are all right with me just reciting a poem by Jill Scott. OK. OK. It's actually a song that, you know, I can't be singing. So <laughs> it goes. You say life's been hard on you. Well, brother, I've got news. It's hard on me, too. We seem to face the same old issues, some at the surface, some deeper in the tissues. You say the world just don't understand. Well, I ain't the world, my love. I'm your woman. And if our ancestors can walk for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles in the dark, I know you can do this. Come on, let's start. Thank you. Last part of Act One from a play called My Rainey's Black Bottom by August Wilson. Oh, I wanted to trigger warning it for sexual assault. Levy got to be Levy, and he don't need nobody messing with him about the white man, because you don't know nothing about me. You don't know Levy. You don't know nothing about what kind of blood I got, what kind of heart I got beating here. He pounds his chest. I was eight years old when I watched a gang of white men come into my daddy's house and have to do with my mama any way that they wanted. Pauses. We was living in Jefferson County, about eight miles outside of Natchez. My daddy's name was Memphis, Memphis Lee Green. Had him near 50 acres of good farming land. I'm talking about good land, growing anything you want. He done, off, he done gone off of shares and bought this land from Mr. Haley's widow woman after he done passed on. Folks called him an uppity nigger because he done saved and borrowed to what he could buy his land and be independent. It was coming on planting time and my daddy went into Natchez to get him some seed and fertilizer. Called me, say, Levy, you the man of the house now. Take care of your mama while I'm gone. But I wasn't a little boy, eight years old. My mama was frying up some chicken when them men's come into that house. Must have been eight or nine of them. She stand, she's standing there frying that chicken, and them men's come and took hold of her, just like you take hold of a mule and make him do what you want. 
There was Mama with a gang of white men. She tried to fight them off, but I could see where it wasn't going to do her any good. I didn't know what they were going to do to her, but I figured whatever it was, they may as well do it to me too. My daddy had a knife that he kept around there for hunting and working and whatnot. I knew where he kept it and went and got it. I'm going to show you how spooked up I was by the white man. I tried my damnedest to cut one of them's throat. I hit him, hit him on the shoulder with it. He reached back and grabbed hold of that knife and whacked me across the chest with it. Levy raises his shirt to show a long, ugly scar. That's what made them stop. They were scared I was going to bleed to death. My mama wrapped a sheet around me and carried me two miles to the furlough place and drove me up to Doc Albans. He was waiting on a calf to be born and say he, ha he ain't have time to see me. They carried me up to Miss Etta, the midwife, and she fixed me up. My daddy came back and acted like he done accepted the facts of what happened, but he got the names of them men's from Mama. He found out who they was, and then we announced we was moving out of the county. Said goodbye to everybody, all the neighbors. My daddy went and smiled in the face of one of them crackers who had been with my Mama, smiled in his face, and sold him our land. We moved over with relations in Caldwell. He got us settled in, and then he took off one day. I ain't never seen him since. He sneaked back, hiding me in the woods, hiding up in the woods, laying to get them eight or nine men. He got four of them before they got him. They tracked him down in the woods, caught up with him and hung him and set him afire. My daddy wasn't spooked up by the white man, no sir, and that taught me how to handle them. I seen my daddy go up and grin in that cracker's face, smile in his face and sell him his land. All the while, he's planning how he's gonna get him and what he's going to do to him. That taught me how to handle them. So you all just back up and leave Levy alone about the white man. I can smile and say yes, sir, to whoever I please. I got time coming to me. You all just leave Levy alone about the white man. There is a long pause. Slow drag begins playing on his bass and sings. If I had my way, if I had my way, if I had my way, I would tear this old building down. Um, I'm going to read from Lucy by Jamaica Kincaid. Um, there's going to be like three separate excerpts, and they're about um, Lucy, a young woman who comes to the United States to work for a white family. And this is about her relationship with the mother of that family. Yeah. Mariah. One morning in early March, Mariah said to me, you have never seen spring, have you? and she did not have to await an answer, for she already knew. She said the word spring as if spring were a close friend, a friend who had dared to go away for a long time and soon would reappear for their passionate reunion. She said, have you ever seen daffodils pushing their way up all out of the ground? And when they're in bloom and all massed together, a breeze comes along and makes them do a curtsy to the lawn stretching out in front of them. Have you ever seen that? When I see that, I feel so glad to be alive. And I thought, so Mariah is made to feel alive by some flowers bending in the breeze. How does a person get to be that way? I remembered an old poem I'd been made to memorize when I was 10 years old and a pupil at Queen Victoria Girls' School. I had been made to memorize it, verse after verse, and then had recited the whole po poem to an auditorium full of parents, teachers, and my fellow pupils. After I was done, everybody stood up and applauded with an enthusiasm that surprised me. And later they told me how nicely I had pronounced every word, how I had placed just the right amount of special emphasis in places where that was needed, and how proud the poet, now long dead, would have been to hear his words ringing out of my mouth. I was then at the height of my two-facedness. That is, outside I seemed one way, inside I was another, outside false, inside true. And so I made pleasant little noises that showed both modesty and appreciation but inside I was making a vow to erase from my mind, line by line, every word of that poem. The night after I recited the poem, I dreamt continuously, it seemed, that I was being chased down a narrow cobbled street by bunches and bunches of the same daffodils that I had vowed to forget. And finally, I fell down from exhaustion and they all piled on top of me until I was buried deep underneath them and was never seen again. I had forgotten all of this until Mariah mentioned daffodils. And now I told it to her with such an amount of anger, I surprised both of us. We were standing quite close to each other, but as soon as I had finished speaking, without a second of deliberation, we both stepped back. It was only one step that I made, but to me it felt if something I had not been aware of had been checked. Mariah reached out to me and rubbing her hand against my cheek said, what a history you have. 
I thought there was a little bit of envy in her voice, and so I said, you are welcome to it if you like. Early that afternoon, because the children, my charges, would not return home from school until three, Mariah took me to a garden, a place she described as among her favorites in the world. She covered my eyes with a handkerchief, and then, holding me by the hand, she walked me to a spot in a clearing. Then she removed the handkerchief and said, now look at this. I looked. It was a big area with lots of thick, trunk, tall trees along winding paths. Along the paths and underneath the trees were many, many yellow flowers the size and shape of play teacups or fairy skirts. They looked like something to eat and something to wear at the same time. They looked beautiful. They looked simple, as if made to erase a complicated and unnecessary idea. I did not know what these flowers were, and so it was a mystery to me why I wanted to kill them. Just like that, I wanted to kill them. I wished that I had an enormous sight. I would just walk down the path, dragging it alongside me, and I would cut these flowers down at the place where they emerged from the ground. Mariah said, these are daffodils. I'm sorry about the poem, but I'm hoping you'll find them lovely all the same. There was such joy in her voice as she said this, such a music. How could I explain to her the feeling that I had about daffodils, that it wasn't exactly daffodils, but that they would do as well as anything else? Where should I start, over here or over there? Anywhere would be good enough, but my heart and my thoughts were racing so that every time I tried to talk, I stammered and by accident bit my own tongue. Mariah, mistaking what was happening to me for joy at seeing daffodils for the first time, reached out to hug me, but I moved away. And in doing that, I seemed to get my voice back. I said, Mariah, do you realize that at 10 years of age, I had to learn by heart a long poem about some flowers I would not see in real life until I was 19? As soon as I said this, I felt sorry that I had cast her beloved daffodils in a scene she had never considered, a scene of conquered and conquests, a scene of brutes masquerading as angels and angels portrayed as brutes. This woman who hardly knew me loved me, and she wanted me to love this thing, a grove brimming over with daffodils in bloom, that she loved also. Her eyes sank back on her head as if they were protecting themselves, as if they were taking a rest after some unexpected hard work. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't my fault, but nothing could change the fact that where she saw beautiful flowers, I saw sorrow and bitterness. The same thing could cause us to shed tears, but those tears would not taste the same. We walked home in silence. I was glad to have at last, at last seen what a wretched daffodil looked like. Mariah and I were saying goodnight to each other the way we always did, with a hug and a kiss, but this time we did it as if we both wished we hadn't gotten such a custom started. She was almost out of the room when she turned and said, I was looking forward to telling you that I have Indian blood, that the reason I'm so good at catching fish and hunting birds and roasting corn and doing all sorts of things is that I have Indian blood. But now, I don't know why, I feel like I shouldn't tell you that. I feel you will take it the wrong way. This really surprised me. What way should I take this? Wrong way? Right way? What could she mean? To look at her, there was nothing remotely like an Indian about her. Why claim a thing like that? I myself had Indian blood in me. My grandmother is a Carib Indian. That makes me one quarter Carib Indian. But I don't go around saying that I have some Indian blood in me. The Carib Indians were good sailors, but I don't like to be on the sea. I only like to look at it. To me, my grandmother is my grandmother, not an Indian. My grandmother is alive. The Indians she came from are all dead. If someone could get away with it, I am sure they would put my grandmother in a museum, as an example of how something now extinct in nature is one of a handful still alive. In fact, one of the museums to which Maria, Mariah had taken me devoted a whole section to people all dead, who were more or less related to my grandmother. Mariah says, I have Indian blood in me, and underneath everything I swear she says it as if she were announcing her possession of a trophy. How do you get to be the sort of victor who can claim to be the vanquished also? I now heard Mariah say, well, and she let out a long breath full of sadness, resignation, even dread. I looked at her. Her face was miserable, tormented, ill-looking. She looked at me in a pleading way, as if asking for relief, and I looked back, my face and my eyes hard. No matter what, I would not give it. I said, all along, I've been wondering how you got to be the way you are, just how it was that you got to be the way you are. Even now, she couldn't let go, and she reached out, her arms open wide, to give me one of her great hugs. But I stepped out of its path quickly, and she was left holding nothing. I said it again. I said, how did you get to be that way? The anguish on her face almost broke my heart, but I would not bend. It was hollow, my triumph. I could feel that. 
but I held on to it just the same.